Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Cyber Security Recruiter podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mika Rubenstein. Mika, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm jealous that you're in that we work with that bouncing atmosphere and I'm sat here working remote all on my own. It sounds like you might be getting a bit of a vibe going on over there. Is it you having fun? Yeah, we work is honestly great. I think it's crucial for being remote. So if you ever are in New York and you want to come work out of WeWork, you let me know. <laughs> yeah. I will do it. Uh, for everyone listening, me and Mika, we're just exchanging stories about that they have a policy whereby, is it three o'clock? They give free beer and wine after three o'clock, although I'm not drinking at the minute. I've not drank for a fair few months now, but I have to say, Mika, I think if I was over there in that we work today with you in New York, I could be running into some problems with the no drinking. I know, it's almost hard not to. Cool, so I'm just going to do you a bit of an intro. Feel free to let me know if I get anything wrong. But started off as a financial analyst at Marcus and, and Millichap. You were there for just over a year. Then you were at Huxley, which, as again, as we were talking about, is a well-known recruitment company that many people in the US and the UK are, are familiar with. You then progressed on uh, to Vetti, where you're a director of strategic initiatives and you are currently at Security Innovation, and you hold the position of Talent Acquisition Manager. So did I get your intro right? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, you nailed it. Cool. Welcome to the show, Mick. I've done you a bit, bit of an intro. I know, I said we were chatting before we click record, and I know you've had some good recruitment experience, but I'll start where I always start, which is who are you and, and what have you been up to over the years um, professionally? Yeah, I'd be happy to share. So like you said, I started as a financial analyst and quickly shifted, I guess, career paths. I started at a recruitment agency. I've always done technical recruitment. And so I was there for a year, learned a lot. And from there, I went to a software company that was geared towards recruitment. So it was like an interviewer software. And I helped build out the sales team there. So I was the business development director. And then I ended up at Security Innovation through someone in my network. And I've been here since October 2021, which is crazy. And specializing still in technical recruitment. And yeah, I'm the sole recruiter at Security Innovation. And it's been really great, honestly. Cool. Sole recruiter. I bet that can be stressful sometimes when the demand kind of uh, ticks up a bit. Yes, it's definitely <laughs> got to manage your time. <laughs> got to manage your time well. Yeah, definitely. Slightly off track, you interview a software. What's that all about? I was going to say I've never heard of that, but I probably have because I get hit up by different people trying to sell me different tech rec all the time. So maybe those guys and girls have, uh, have approached. I don't know. But yeah, what did that involve? High volume roles. So think like hospitality. Whenever you get inundated with resumes and you really just need somebody to be able to check the boxes. So as soon as a candidate would apply for one of these like high volume positions, like the software would automatically set them up with an interviewer. So you would automatically get a phone call. Somebody would be on the other line. It would be like a real person who would be getting paid through vet, but it would be like it, it very well known in like the gig economy, I would say. And they would do like these 15 minute interviews and just really check the boxes, follow script. And it was a really good way to weed people out. Cause like I said, they really just need to know like the basic, do you have a car? Are you able to come in? Are you able to work night shifts, whatever the case may be? Yeah, it was a really awesome experience. I was with them from the very beginning whenever it was just an idea. So it was really cool to watch it like come into fruition. And yeah, I think I just saw them last January at a, a recruitment conference. So they seem to be really taking off, which is awesome. Cool. Imagine actually in this market with a high volume of applicants, I can... Just listen to you speak there. I can imagine that tech coming in pretty handy right now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, look, it's interesting that you mentioned that you got your current position because of your network. It'll be interesting to to talk about that. I think leveraging your, your network is a great way to, to move forward in personal life, professional life, things like that. So we'll definitely dig into that. Where I'd, I'd like to go at the minute is we mentioned their high volume of applicants for the market starting to track back up a bit. Certain offers that I've been dealing with at the minute, we're getting 
attention from current employers and counter offers and stuff like that are starting to come back in. And I've not really dealt with that since 2022 and we dealt with it for the first time this week. So I feel like the market's kind of tracking up a, a bit. But the question is for those people out there that are, are still struggling or on the market, I know a lot of people are going through tough times. What, what's the ideal can be cybersecurity candidate or can be candidate in general? What kind of ideal characteristics are you looking for when people are approaching you to apply for a job? Yeah, no, I would definitely agree that the market has shifted quite significantly. You can see there's a lot of folks on the market right now um, in every industry, it feels. My biggest advice or what I look for are candidates that truly match or align with the job description that we are hiring for. Oftentimes, people might apply to see if like it could be a good fit, but ultimately, Whatever your experience is or what your background is, make sure it's very aligned with the jobs that you're applying for. And if you are looking to make like a shift, I would make sure that your resume and your experience like can testify to whatever that role is that you're looking for. I would say that's probably basic, but honestly, like the best piece of advice I would give. No, no, definitely, because how many people don't follow that advice? And I actually saw a, a post on LinkedIn the other day that was just encouraging people to apply for everything. What, why would you do that? It's like we say, you've got to make sure it's applicable. And look, for people like me, it, it keeps me in a job because I know a lot of our clients get so frustrated with how hard job adverts can be and, and hence the reason why they, they engage us. So it does keep us as an agency busier. But yeah, you've got to make sure it's applicable because... If it's me and you on the receiving end of the job advert and someone's applying, it's not fair on, on me and you. It's not fair on the candidates to themselves, either if they're just hitting apply, apply. I think that's when people can get kind of despondent and upset. So, yeah, it is a it is simplistic, but, it, but it's true, Mick. A lot of people, <laughs> we don't really run job adverts, but I had a librarian apply for a job advert that I put up for a network security engineer. Once. A lot of that, too which I, it's tough. Like I, I do get it from the other end, especially if you're trying to break into a new industry or shift your career path. But ultimately, like if you're applying like on LinkedIn or any job board, yeah, if your resume isn't aligned with the role, there's a very small chance that it would actually articulate to anything, especially since you mentioned there's just so many applications right now. Yeah, yeah, there is. I, th I think if people just took a, I think I've said it before in a previous episode, but slow down to, to speed up. If, if people just went, right, there's five mega jobs there that definitely suit me. They just took a really personalized approach. They genuinely knew they were a good fit. And maybe even just stick with those five or say 10 and then follow up with those five or 10. They're absolutely on the money. And if you did that and then reviewed it every week or two, you'd probably have more success quicker anyway and everyone would be happier. But in the age of AI and automation, I don't know, we're, we're getting a bit off track. Definitely. No, I think 100% being intentional is super key. Yeah, cool. So you mentioned to get your current role that was through your network. Was that just a professional friend or a work friend? Is there any stories there that could help the listener? Which was the first agency in my first job in recruitment. We, by chance, were also neighbors in the city, which is wild literally next door neighbors, no idea. So we, <laughs> we got pretty close because we'd walk to work and we parted ways from the agency, but we always stayed in touch. And she ended up getting an offer from Twitter and needed to backfill a position here at Security Innovation. And she reached out and honestly sold me very quickly on the company. It's a very healthy culture, really great product and service. And it was technical recruitment, which I had experience in. So I interviewed for it, ended up getting the role. And now I'm here almost three years later. Yeah, cool. That must have been really funny though. So you didn't realize you were neighbors. We walk in home. Hang on. Is she following me? <laughs> no, it was actually crazy. So we, yeah, we ended up getting really close because we would walk to and from work every day. So funny how things work out. Yeah, it is. Cool. Yeah. So you've been there coming up to three years. How are you finding that? I don't know if you agree with this, but I think for me, the market probably bottomed out in the middle of 2023, maybe something like that. Like we've noticed a bit of things tracking up a bit. Certain aspects of security are still candidate-led, but on the whole, I'm feeling like it's still a, a client-led market. Have you noticed any uptick recently? Or are you still seeing a, a high level of applicants or what are you seeing out there? 
I think I always see an influx of applicants whenever graduation is around the corner. So we're getting a lot of grad students or even bachelor students. But I think maybe with graduation coming up and then the market in general, there's definitely been yeah an influx. Yeah, it, it mellowed out, I would say. I would agree, like 2023 and then picking back up to speed. Like you say, and for everyone listening, it was COVID kind of created this artificially high demand. And I think every yeah. company in the world post-COVID just got really, really excited on the hiring front. And then now's been the dip, start of this year and last year. And then I'm hoping just for a bit of normality, like even those boom times can be, you'd think it was like great being a recruiter, but it can actually be a bit too much because you're not really stopping. And then when it goes bust, it's like, oh, it'd be nice to have a bit of balance, I think is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. It, it, it's very much a roller coaster. It's highs and lows, like a lot of work or you're looking for, for stuff to do, think people to recruit, jobs to fill. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, recruitment doesn't really have much of a balance. <laughs> No, it doesn't. I think you have to learn to, I don't know, I think you have to almost learn to detach from it a a little bit emotionally, although it's hard because when you get to know people and through a process and stuff like that, and especially if you're connecting with them and getting on well, it's tricky. I I was working really long hours and I said to myself, I'm going to start taking Fridays off or Friday afternoons off, but it just never happens. The processes are always coming to the end for me on a Friday. Um, It's just the worst day ever to take off. Yeah, same. So, Mika, when people are applying, when it comes to resumes, I feel like you can ask 10 people what's the best way to format a resume and get about five or six different answers. So, it'd be nice to hear from someone that's hiring right now, receiving a lot of applications. It'd be nice to hear from you what you like to see on the resume visuals format how many pages that kind of thing what's the best tips you've got there for the listeners yeah resumes is definitely a good topic i think it would go back to being intentional i think being short and clean with your resumes is super helpful i wouldn't go longer than two pages if you can have it one page that'd be great i think there's mixed feelings about like when you should cut off your, like sharing your experience. My rule of thumb is anything past five or seven years. I typically am not spending too much time like reading into it. So anything that's recent, make sure you're highlighting your specific experience. And then keep in mind that it's like a highlight reel. So you're going to be able to have the opportunity if you get an interview to speak more deeply with your experience, really just highlighting to the point what your experience is the best bet you want it to be readable so short and clean is my advice yeah okay so short and clean two pages anything over five and seven years you're probably not going to spend too much time on it if you're being really real on that and then any recent highlights make them really clear because another one for you because I've had a few recruiters on the show now. And again, I get different answers on this. If I had pinged you my resume and I really wanted to have an interview with you and join your company, would you like it if I messaged you on LinkedIn separately or a pro? Because I know some people really like this. Some people hate it. What's your thoughts on that? I want to encourage everybody to reach out to recruiters and then company and hiring managers. We've definitely hired people from that experience. But again, if what you're looking for isn't like on our job board or relevant to the company, it makes it tough to entertain like all of those messages. So I would just be intentional with who you reach out to and make sure that what it would make sense. I do encourage people to reach out. I think it's a really great way to show your interest. Yeah. 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 Cool. Sometimes I think actually you, you use the word intentional there and I think you've got to be intentional i think you've got to make it personalized i think if you're reaching out with questions that for argument's sake if i was to ask you a question about something that's blatantly written on your careers page i can see why that would get quite frustrating quite quickly it's using your initiative the thing i get make i get a lot, of people, a lot of people reaching out going hi tom how are you and it's like okay what do you want <laughs> And he's like, come on, Mac, I'm so busy. What? Yeah, yes, I'm great. How are you? It's, I think intentional, get to the point, personalized, and just keep in yeah. mind that everyone's uh, flat out. Just average, how many applicants are you getting on average, would you say, per 
the role at the moment? Currently, it's been, like I mentioned, a pretty big influx. We recently just posted a position and in 24 hours, we had 460 applicants, I think. And I did go through every single one of them. But yeah, just overnight, I was shocked. I've never seen that, honestly. So I think that's the other thing too, is to keep in mind that there's clearly a lot of folks on the market. Anything to make you stand out in terms of how you would add value to the position or to the company is like very crucial. You end up getting to a point where you have, you're working with five really awesome candidates, like amazing candidates, but there's only one role. So it just, it's tough. You're up against a lot right now. Yeah. It's just nice for people to hear how many applicants you're getting. If it's just a generic send over, it's, you've got, I think you've got to have some personalization. There. It's nice for people to hear that the volume that, that you're dealing with. Where are your friends that sell this interview in uh, software to help you out when you need them? Hey, <laughs> yeah, no, cool. All right, Mika. So we've talked there about resume formatting and, and the application process. When it comes down to interviews, is there any do's and don'ts for you? I think if I asked it like this, if I was having an interview with you tomorrow, what could I do to impress you? What should I avoid doing? Any do's or don'ts on that front to increase chances of success? So it's a really good question. As a recruiter, I do try and be mindful of the fact that I'm speaking with candidates that I'm sure are interviewing at a lot of other companies. But some feedback that I've received from hiring managers whenever candidates will get to that stage is candidates who know about the company and not in the way where like they're telling us about the company that we work at, but expressing interest, like a genuine interest and expressing like the fact that they've done their research or their homework weighs very heavily with them. To that point, though, I think that especially in tech, sometimes you don't really know what the company actually does. So I would be careful with like how you approach it. And with that, I think that there's a way to show your interest, but also position yourself to ask the hiring managers or the recruiter to explain more in depth about the company or what the day-to-day -day looks like and just more information about the company because that's how you'll be able to also build off of a pretty good foundational conversation with whoever it is that you're interviewing with. So yeah, I would say show interest in the company and also ask questions to understand more about what the company really is. Even at a, at a recruitment agency, which is very straightforward, you don't know what the company or team actually does until you're in it. So yeah, a balance between showing interest, but also wanting to learn more. Yeah. Okay, cool. And would you say, do you think you should ask questions at the end? If so, how many? What are your thoughts on that? I think the questions are good if they're genuine. So if you have questions, definitely ask. The questions that you ask should be relevant to the interviewer, but I think having a fluid discourse is more helpful, if not more effective. So being able to keep up that conversation, you can also, kind of, like I mentioned earlier, ask them questions about the role, have it be more conversational, and then end that conversation with thanking the interviewer and letting them know that they've answered a lot of the questions that they've had so that it was an effective discourse. Yeah, I think... That I think that's definitely true. When you think about it, it's going to be way, it, it, almost to leave all the questions to the end and not ask anything. It, it's almost too formal, too structured. It's not yeah. real. I know before we hit record, I was talking about we plan this show out. If you don't stick to the plan, which I never do, because it, it, it's more yeah. of a real conversation. And it's, um, exactly. Yeah. So with you, I think like a conversation, it, those are also the best interviews that I have. It's whenever it's a back and forth and learning about them, telling them, sharing about the company, about the role and building off of that. And yeah, definitely true. Yeah, cool. You mentioned that they're the best interviews you've had when it's back and forth. I wanted to ask you, what is the best interview you've ever done and why? And what did that guy or girl do to impress you that the listeners could learn from? I would say whenever, not to repeat myself, but honestly, whenever it's a fluid conversation, a healthy balance of learning about the candidates, sharing our expectations and building off of each other. Because either way, if somebody does the majority of the speaking, the excitement will naturally just trail off. Also going back to 
my original point of just being intentional about the roles that you apply to and knowing like what your value and capabilities are and how they directly align with the position. Whenever somebody's explaining or giving me a background of what they've done and it's literally like exactly what we're looking for, it gets me excited to be able to like delve deeper into exactly what they've done and like how we could be a really good fit. So yeah, and it's tough because Sometimes it's also just about the chemistry that you have with the person that you're speaking to. And it, I try to be mindful of that as well. Oftentimes people will be nervous in interviews, which is also totally normal. So I do try as an interviewer, create like a comfortable environment to break that ice. But yeah, if you can push through like the nerves or the awkwardness or the formality even, and really be able to have a, a fluid discourse. I would say that's like the best type of interviews. I think so. I think that's it. When it's natural, it just flows. It just flows so much better. I think you mentioned it a second ago. If you like someone as much as it, sh- I don't know if it should or it shouldn't, but it definitely does. If you just connect with someone, it really helps. And I wanted to talk to you about communication skills and the importance of them and things like that. Any tips for the listeners that, that want to improve their communication skills is there any kind of little things that you like in 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 the process i know one recruiter that i know she really likes it just when people just follow up after you've had a call just if you've enjoyed the call just actually tell that person that you have it just it's only a small little thing but it does make a difference have you got anything like that that you like about the follow-up email but 100 percent send the follow-up email even if you know that it's not a fit i think that it, it shows like that it shows an appreciation. I think it, it really is important to do that. But other than that, I I'm trying to think about good communication skills. I know a lot of people try to have ask awkward questions in the beginning. Oh, I see you're in New York. Like where do you live? Things like that, which do I always appreciate that, and I I try to build off of that as much as I can. But I would say being an active listener and I would say maybe active listening. Sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect where, you know, maybe like they're, I, I'm not sure, but yeah, maybe active listening. Mm-hmm. Listen, uh, yeah, a- active listening is is hard like i've noticed since doing this pod and i, I think what's it hard is because sometimes we're thinking about what to say next and it makes it really hard to to listen and i don't know i don't know if you've got any tips for the listeners make I, I i think really it, it's just doing it i feel like my active listening skills have got better since doing this pod anyway so i think it's the more you do something the the, the better you get it i think listening is like a real skill and if you can get good at it, it really helps the communication flow doesn't it yeah absolutely I will say, I think that working at an agency for my first recruitment job, a lot of the job was just listening, especially whenever we were bringing on new clients. It was like, I think it's like the 80-20 rule where you want them to be speaking 80% of the time and you limiting yourself to 20% and making sure that 20% is like value and only Mm. value. Some advice that I got actually that might be helpful was people forget 80% of a conversation Typically, they won't remember what you spoke about or how long you spoke about things, but they'll always remember how you make them feel. So keeping that in mind is also helpful. And because of that, I also transcribe all my interviews as I'm doing them literally like a typewriter because it's true. Like you're in a conversation, you're not totally going to remember everything that you spoke about. So yeah. Yeah. You always think you're going to remember. And then if you don't, yeah, if you don't. (laughs) If you don't make those notes. And I started to even be like, whenever I'm taking my call notes, be like, they have a dog or they like to go to whatever. Little things to help me remember, I don't know, any defining points to to Mm. bring them together. It it makes a massive difference. I, I know from just that attention to detail and staying close to people. If I think seeing a little bit now, but certainly in 2022, when it was really candidate led, I I noticed if the role was right for the candidate and I genuinely thought they were a great fit, I would just make an effort to stay stupidly close to them. And it got results. It really makes a difference. So for for everyone listening, these little things, and I know some of my friends that run companies and they're absolutely obsessed with what you're saying there about the dog or the cat or what they've got going on or where they're going on holiday and, 
all these little things and it it does make a difference actually having a decent memory actually does make a difference as well because <laughs> sometimes you just have to re- you just have to remember stuff the note-taking one Luke, is massive it's like when you first start recruitment and you don't take them and you have to ring that person straight oh. back and be like uh, what did you say <laughs> I learned the hard way. I remember my first week, I didn't write down one of the questions we were supposed to ask. And my manager was like, you just call them right back. And I was like, we just hung up the call. And he's like, I call them back. <laughs> yeah. Also, it was easier back then too, to remember things because you're also meeting clients and candidates in person. So having everything be virtual, it is like almost extra crucial to get any type of defining fact about the candidate because you're not going to be taking them to coffee in the afternoon. I know we were talking about it before I, before we came on. I, I do miss, I prefer remote, but I do miss it. I, I, I don't know. I think, I know we were talking about like meeting up every six weeks before we hit record, weren't we, in different company. And it's, I think it does make a difference when you meet. But do you, do you ever get to meet any candidates anymore or are those days gone for you? Yeah, they're pretty much over now. I only meet them once they're employees which is Mm. equally as exciting, if not more Mm. exciting. But yeah, it was a nice part to the job pre-COVID. Yeah, I think so. I was so excited about remote first, but yeah, you do miss it. I know some people that work like the insurance market in London, and it's all in this one square mile. And everyone is just all the companies, all the clients, all the candidates are just within this one square mile, the, the city in, in London. So you just go in there and just, if it's the daytime, you have coffees. If it's the evenings, you're on the beers and that you just recruit in person. I mean, I'm jealous. It sounds great, doesn't it? It really does. It's also like one of the best ways to build your network and nurture those relationships too. Mm. You have to go out of your way now and make the effort to, to really nurture those folks in your network. Yeah, I think as well, it's more powerful now. If someone sends you a letter or a birthday card or you meet someone in person, it's not the norm anymore. So it's probably amplified its power. So I think anyone out, yeah, anyone that's trying to build relationships or make themselves stand out. Like if if I was applying for a job with you, Mika, and I actually posted my resume to your office, I'm sure it would make it stand out. Yeah, of course, (laughs) percent. Yeah, you're going to get a load of resumes posted to your office now. So I don't know if we might have already answered this one. So if we have, forgive me, but I just wanted to ask, what what do you think the difference is between an average candidate and an amazing candidate? Is there anything else people can do or anything in general people can do to really stand out in the process? Yes, actually, aside from what we spoke about, specific to like our engineering department, We're very into like professional development and community. A lot of, almost all of our engineers are involved in community or like even discords to some extent. My point being they're, they really are passionate security engineers. So it's not just like a nine to five for them. Like they're keeping up on security news. They're, you know, getting a new certification, maybe a training and something that SI actually offers, which is great, the professional development budget for them towards like conferences, trainings, or certs, in addition to one week of research time for them as well. And that's just to preserve the fact that they really are passionate about the industry in general. So I would say standing out would be like that involvement. So whether it's like specifically like with security candidates, like if they are involved in any like CTFs, like hack the box or try and hack me, literally even just like discord channels that they're a part of, things like that, I would say, like really showing your passion and involvement is, is huge. It's also one of the ways to be promoted internally for security engineers is to show like how you are showing your involvement or I guess adding value back to the security community. We have some engineers that are professors now at the University of Washington, which is so cool. So yeah, and I think it's also really exciting and fun for people too, like whether it's security or any industry, being involved in your community really does show and add value, not only like to your potential like career opportunities, but it's like a gentle reminder for yourself too, as like why you're in your field. And I guess just give you a sense of community. I love that you've said all that, by the way, because this is, I, I, I really advocate for that. And I think especially in security. So you mentioned there, so this is this part of certain things that the guys and girls in your company do and it gets a promotion so if they're really community-led it means that they can advance quicker basically internally 
you said yeah so, yeah there's like a bunch of different like there's a like a track that you can follow and it's all written down for you but one of the things that you can do like towards like a promotion is like showing you, like that involvement and it's not even necessarily involvement I guess like certifications trainings like things like that so yeah it's like a good way to be promoted internally it's also a good way to just like I said remind yourself why you're in it in the first place and yeah it, it shows like the true passion yeah of the role yeah it does and i think as well there's, there's so many benefits the, the phrase i always use is making your resume 3d it's like when you if you if, if someone applies and like their github repos are re absolutely banging they're all over out the box or try out maybe they've got a youtube channel maybe they've been on a podcast or got a podcast and i'm not saying everyone's got to do right. that probably a podcast is quite a big step but i just think the more you can do and the more you can make that profile 3d the better do you know what else i think obviously like we've seen major ups in the market where it was like the candidates were just completely in control and then now it's gone to the clients in control and then now it's probably just going to keep going back either way as the market does it's very cyclical but i think for those people out there that have got really strong personal brands i almost feel like they put a force field around themselves from like a job security perspective as well i think if someone's brand is really strong and they're adding lots of value above and beyond the day job i think it can really help their progression and internal promotions as you mentioned but i think it can really help their job security and stability you know there's there's so much as well as helping other people in the community it's a lot of benefits isn't there yeah there's definitely a lot of value and also going back about being remote as well is if you're able to go into in-person events or like even conferences or networking events it one, you meet people that could help you down the road. And if you're meeting them in person, like you're going to leave a lasting impression, at least more so than you would like virtually. Yeah. And now, now that things like have officially, it feels back up, we're finally able to tap back into that. Are you getting loads of pictures from RSA conference on your LinkedIn profile at all? You're getting I'm, a lot of it, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting a lot. Of, yes, my LinkedIn is, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I think as I get it booked in, because we all see these conferences and we all feel too busy and this, that, and other. But if something's scheduled in and it's locked in and maybe it's paid for, you're committed then. And it's one of those, it's like, we always feel like we're too busy to do x y and z or whatever it is but when we get there and when we do it we're always going it's a bit like, a bit like doing the podcast like some days i'm like oh god i've got so much to do but then when i'm in the throat like now like i'm in this i'm really enjoying this but that like, you always it's feel the, like too busy to stop i know it's the anticipation <laughs> for everything i went to a conference actually last january and I think the best part of the conference was actually the people that i met whether it was like the vendors or the other like recruiters and there were agency recruiters or internal recruiters. There were like a, a really broad, there's so many different types of people in the recruitment industry. And while the content was give or take, I don't know how helpful it was, the people that I met, like actually they're still in my network. I still am talking to them. And yeah, I definitely wouldn't have connected with them otherwise. It's like you said at the start, the reason that you are where you are now is because of your personal connection with someone. It's if you've ever heard this saying when, over the years in recruitment but there's a saying like your network is your net worth and all that and it just always comes back i think if you're working in the same area for a long time whether it's recruitment or security i think all this stuff we're talking about is really relevant because like the security community even across the whole of the u.s is pretty small like everyone knows everyone and stuff like that so if you're being nice you're doing things right and you're making the effort it really Maybe not straight away, but it really does come back round, I've found. Yeah, I would mm. agree with that 100%. Cool. Yeah, so the people on the team, they're, they're professors as well. So they're teaching as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah. just cool. really awesome. There's so many of our engineers, so much involvement in the community. Like, I'm definitely, like, blanking right now. I know there's one that has her own podcast and YouTube channel, but yeah, and it's also really inspiring and rewarding to like work alongside some very talented individuals. Because ultimately at the end of the day, the technical skills are great and obviously much needed, but this is one really good way to stand out. And it's also a really big reason why like the company culture is what it is. Yeah, definitely. I always think you mentioned that technical skills are important. I think if 
people can combine communication skills, technical skills with some of the online stuff we're talking about. I, I think if you do that consistently for a sustained period of time, I just don't think you can't not succeed. Yeah. Like you, it, it will always click in the end. It might. Some people it might click pretty quick something might take a bit longer but if you do those three things i think you're sorted i think consistency is, is the key word there too <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah. consistency is hard <laughs> it, is, yeah. Yeah. it is hard i find with the posting and stuff like that i've managed to stay busy. i think it's all it's quite easy to like listen to a pod and get excited but the discipline and the consistency side is really where it's at and you mentioned there about girl on the team doing a pod and and, and stuff like that and I think as well for anyone listening, I, uh, I think you just try and make the push to start. Like I can actually remember writing my first post or like even just resharing someone else's stuff and writing a little caption with it. Like at first, that seems like a big deal. I think mm -hmm. you've just got to get you've just got to get started. And now, obviously, you can, once you've done that for a bit, you can just write a post with ease. So I think it's just exercising that muscle and yeah. pushing yourself. It makes a difference. It really is just starting. I remember the first like LinkedIn post that I, I made and pressing like the post button. I was so nervous, but now I, I it's, you get used to it and you get comfortable with it. Yeah. And with consistency, eventually you become really good at it too. It really is. It's rewarding. It is. I think as well, like I posted some stuff before and I've had internal conversations and I've gone, is that all right? Can I say that? And people are like, Tom, no one's bothered, like, just post. And I think sometimes, like, in our heads, like, what yeah, we're we saying, yeah, like, in my head, that this, I've done it a few times. I think we, yeah, we can over overthink it. I find since I've been remote, I'm overthinking more because I'm not with as many people. Bounce ideas off each other. That is one thing that I do miss about being in person while I do prefer remote having that discourse just to, about how you're wording an email even, just the mm. small thing. It's, it is something that I miss. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I know from the day the day to day, even if you're doing something, you just want someone else that does the same thing as you, that's done it well for a long time, to just put your arm around you and just go, yeah, you're doing it right. It's like, hey, sweet. <laughs> you're exactly where you need to be. It's okay. yeah. We should all go to WeWork. We should all meet up in WeWork. I know. Um, it's honestly been such a blessing this past year. I, I really can't say that enough. And it's not like I go every day, but I do try and go like three times a week. And even just working in an environment with other people working is mm. encouraging. Yeah, I think just having that change. But they always say a change is as good as a rest and stuff like that. I do think yeah. it really makes a difference. But yeah, it's cool. So I know before we spoke about, you, you knew I was going to ask you about podcasts and books. So you made a bit of a special effort for me and the listeners. Yeah, you've got one or two recommendations. And I think we, I think the list is that definitive that we might have to, we might, we'll might we have to put it in the show notes after because it's quite long from what uh, you're saying. Yeah, I will definitely send over everything that they shared. But like specific, what, he, what Thomas asked was what were some podcasts or books that like had an influence on security engineers and why. And so I did ask some folks in the engineering team and they gave me some really awesome resources. It sounds like OSU has a, a resource called Cybersecurity Canon, where they have just a list of must read books. And I guess there is a, maybe an influencer or a writer in the space named Kevin Mitnick, who looks like based off of the notes might be a little bit controversial. So take that with a grain of salt. I'm not sure what that means, but yeah. the book is Ghost in the Wires. And yeah, they sent me a lot of great stuff. So I will go ahead and, and send that to you for you to post. And yeah, I think it'll be a great tool. Uh, yeah, cool. So we'll get all those in the show. So yeah, so Kevin Mitnick's a very famous hacker. He's no no longer with us anymore. But yeah, he was controversial. And uh, I think a lot of people, I think he's pretty divisive. But I think a lot of people were like... <laughs> He was basically, he was basically a bad, he was a black hat turned white hat. He was a bad okay. guy turned good. Everyone, yeah, everyone loves that's those. A, that's, that's like the best villain origin story. <laughs> or I guess it would be the reverse villain origin story. Cool. So, Mika, as we come to the end here, what kind of common mistakes do you see people making in interviews where people could step it up or any, anything like that? Any things on that front to, to avoid that could be helpful? I would say if you're going to do it, if you're going to interview, if you're going to apply, if you're going to do an assignment, to do it wholeheartedly as much as you can, which is to your original point, maybe picking five 
roles that you want to apply to and, and really sticking that through might be a better approach. Because of all of the influx in applicants, we started to have candidates do assignments to be able to see how they would be in situations and speed up the process in that sense. It's also really a good tool to go off of when talking to them because you have a baseline of reference. But the reason why we did that is because of the influx. You can tell whenever a candidate has completed it just to complete it. And you can also tell whenever a candidate has been super intentional about it and like really did put so much effort into it. And sometimes like that effort alone is enough to warrant a an interview. Cool. Do people... Do you ever catch people out using chat GPT? I haven't, but we've had some <laughs> suspicions during the technical interview. Yeah, I can imagine. Do you know another thing about preparing? I saw a post. Do you, do you ever do you ever follow do you follow do you know a guy called Alex Hormonesy? Do you ever follow him? I don't. I'll, I'll send you him. He's I really like him. He's quite motivational and he basically had a load of he's a US guy, I can't remember where he's from, but he had a load of gyms and it all went wrong. And anyway, he's done really well. And he did a post basically saying, if you just take twenty minutes out and just intensely prepare for something just really hardcore for twenty minutes, you'll be amazed. You'll go into an interview or a call or a client meeting or an application process more prepared than most. So just taking perhaps not as much time as you think, but just a really focused intense 20 minutes yeah i really like that i think that could probably be applied to a lot of things so yeah as we come to the end Mick, i think that's it we've covered kind of most things what's the plans for the rest of the for the year for you and the guys and girls on the team have you got kind of growth plans and stuff like that or is there any kind of candidates that you're looking to hear from at the minute that you're on the lookout for I guess for this year, we've been pretty consistent with like our hiring, at least for security engineers. We have a lot of, we have about seven interns starting this summer, which is super exciting. Our internship program is really great. It's a really good opportunity for them to, that actually is in person in our Seattle office. And so you're working in person alongside, like I said, really talented engineers. And yeah, so excited about that. Hopefully we'll have the opportunity to head out to Seattle to meet them. But yeah, I would say other than that, it's been pretty consistent, at least on the engineering side for right now. The, 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 our busy season is typically like with the interns and getting through all those applicants. Talk about an influx of candidates <laughs> getting it from so many different colleges. So yeah, yeah I think it's really exciting. Yeah, no, that's, that sounds really good. I think, I don't know if anyone listening is will be in the Seattle area, but to get that in-person learning through osmosis, side by side, like almost the old school self-development. I think that's so valuable. How do you apply for the internship? Is it quite hard to get in or is there a a lot of places or a few? So we advertise on Handshake, which most colleges have, have that. And we actually start our application process or we start our interview process in as early as November. So November, December, and January, we're aggressively interviewing candidates. And again, like we really do want to give people a fair shot, all the applicants. So you'll start with a technical round or a take home challenge, essentially provide a write up. We review the write up. And then from there, it's just like about scheduling and three heavy months of intern recruitment and it's awesome like the program's really great and i think that it's so nice to be able to be in person especially during that time yeah i think so i think for juniors they really need that in person i think it's huge do people tend to stick around after that internship i imagine it buys quite a bit of loyalty yeah we've actually had a lot of our engineers become full-time employees yeah yeah cool all right Michael. listen it's been nice i think we're coming towards the end is there any have we missed anything or have we about nailed it? Yeah, we covered a lot of ground. This was really awesome. And I'm really glad we finally were able to connect and do this. And it's always great to be able to just have some discourse with another recruiter about the industry. Yeah, no, definitely. I think we were originally trying to do this at the start. Of, it was as far as it goes last year, but definitely the start of this year, wasn't it? Yeah. We got there in the end. We did, we did. Cool. Thanks for your time. You've set the record for having to move rooms mid-podcast. Well done. You, you hold a special award for that one, but it was good. And thanks for your time. There's some really helpful insights there, and it's been really nice talking to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome.